Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. One brother in custody, the other still on the run. 30-year-old Sihifredo Montemayor is in the Bear County Jail tonight, facing an attempted capital murder charge in connection with the shooting of Balcones Heights Police Sergeant Joe Sepulveda. This was him being walked to the magistrate's office just moments ago. We got word that the elder brother was arrested in Mexico yesterday and this afternoon. He was in the Bear County Jail. 27 year old Wilfredo Montemayor, meanwhile, last reported to still be out there. Our Patty Santos, who was there when this suspect was walked moments ago, joins us live from the jail. What do we know at this point, Patty? So we know that that's well, one of the things that the Bear County Sheriff uh, is telling us tonight that the fact that they have one of the suspects, Sigifredo Montemayor, here in the jail in the United States uh, gives them a lot of confidence that they're not far away from uh, capturing the second suspect, his brother, uh, Wilfredo Montemayor. Uh, again, we got a chance just a few minutes ago to watch him as he was escorted into the jail. We want to show you that video. One of the things that he said was that he was glad that the officer is still alive and also saying that it is because he loves his family that he turned himself in uh, the sheriff also filling us in on how that um, that uh, arrest and that um, being able to bring him to the United States uh, happened because at first they believe you know that this might have taken a long process but uh, as we know tonight he's back in the US take a listen it's being termed a self surrender he agreed voluntarily to come back to the United States was brought to the border uh, by the Tamalipa, Tamalipa State Patrol and was, was delivered to U.S. authorities. And tonight we also know that he is hurt. The sheriff telling us uh, that he has a bullet hole in the back and the shoulder, uh, but he has already been treated. He was walking into the jail without any problems. Also tonight, some good news. The sheriff giving us an update on uh, Balcones Heights Sergeant uh, Joey Sepulveda telling us he has been able to communicate with his family, writing messages, but that, that is some good news. We're going to continue to follow this story and bring you more coming up tonight on the night beat. Patty Santos live from the Bear County Jail. Thank you, Patty. Get ready for March Madness live and direct right here in San Antonio in a way like never before. Today, the mayor, along with the NCAA representatives, announced the entire NCAA Division I women's basketball tournament will be hosted in South Texas from the second round on in San Antonio for the first time. As Devin Clark explains, business owners and locals have high hopes for positive economic results. Yeah, I'm uh, really excited about it. Like our city needs a breath of fresh air. San Antonio and our surrounding communities will be the site for the 64 team NCAA Women's Basketball Championship. In groundbreaking news, San Antonio is hosting a one of a kind March Madness featuring 63 televised games and downtown business owners are thrilled by the anticipated economic impact. A little God wink about us getting our lives back to normal fellowshipping with each other, being with each other. The fellowshipping part will be drastically different this year. Right now, only players' families are allowed in the games, and officials say that the decision on whether fans will be allowed may not be reached until right before the tournament starts. Our number one priority is to provide a safe environment. NCAA players must have seven consecutive negative tests before coming to town, and they'll travel by private charter. They'll have routine tests once they arrive, and the players are required to stay in small designated groups. Even without the thousands of extra fans, the increased NCAA traffic is well received. Our staff is super excited. They can make some money. The Riverwalk has really been hit. It is very quiet down here. I think it's the best news we've heard in a year. Now, earlier today, Mayor Ron Nirenberg announced that he anticipates during the tournament more than 35,000 room nights to downtown San Antonio. Of course, a big score for a lagging hospitality industry. Reporting outside of the Alamo Dome, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. More details today on the city's plans to possibly purchase a hotel to help house homeless people. The city's been leasing two hotels since April to help the homeless population. One is used for isolating COVID cases, and another acts as an extension of the Haven for Hope campus. An assistant director for the city's Department of Human Services said they're considering using one of those hotels 
possibly a different one, as they prepare a recommendation for the city council. It could be for additional emergency shelter uh, if, that's, we're, if that's needed, um, with a long-term goal of, of converting it into permanent housing uh, to give folks a place to, to live permanently. Steck did not provide any kind of timeline. Several people looking for a place to stay after an overnight fire at an apartment complex on the southwest side. Firefighters were called to the Rio Springs apartments in the 2800 block of West Hutchins Place. That was around 1230 this morning. Crews tell us that fire burned so intensely the floors inside the building collapsed on each other. Everyone who was inside, along with their pets, was able to make it out safely. However, one firefighter was taken to a hospital as a precaution. The flames caused around $175,000 in damages. Still no word on what caused that fire. He lost a close election in the 2019 San Antonio mayor's race, ultimately losing to incumbent Ron Nuremberg. Former District 6 City Council member Greg Brockhouse back for another shot this year. Brockhouse making it official today, filing the paperwork to join an already crowded field that makes around eight candidates who want their names on the May ballot, including the current mayor seeking another term, Ron Nuremberg. And there still could be more before it's all said and done. The deadline to file is next Friday. Election Day is May 1st. There are COVID concerns, but the rodeo continues on in San Antonio and rodeo officials say preventing the spread of COVID-19 is their top priority. Today, we got a tour of the changes made to the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. Organizers say they are following all the state guidelines issued by Governor Greg Abbott. Seats will be socially distanced, 40% capacity, and many sanitizing stations. They also added a few safety measures of their own. We also have all kinds of air filtration going on um, that we've gone out and we purchased that are going to be used in the barns. There are air, air filtration purification systems. We have this bioesk you know, wipe down system. We have volunteer teams. They're going to be constantly with these boards. Say, keep your mask up, keep your distancing. You know, we, our people have embraced that. The rodeo is February 11th to the 28th. For more details, head to our website at ksat.com. Time saver traffic now. Let's take a look here at the Transguide camera at Loop 410 in Ingram. You can see a slowdown out there. We don't really have any indication as to why. Maybe just uh, the time of day, the Friday commute, not far from the mall, but things slow going at 410 and Ingram looking west. New at 6, it is the American Heart Association's Wear Red Day for Heart Health Awareness. While this special day might seem to be overshadowed by the pandemic this year, pediatric cardiologists are seeing a growing trend that actually links the two. Ursula Perry explains why your child's sudden heart issue may be something different entirely. Heart pounding, feeling sick and overwhelmed, tension and pain in the neck. Dr. Lane Maldonado, a pediatric cardiologist at UT Health San Antonio, says increasingly alarmed parents are bringing their children into her office, convinced a heart attack is happening. If a child has uh, chest pain or palpitations, it's almost always not cardiac related, unlike adults. Um, but stress and anxiety can bring on a lot of these symptoms that would point people towards thinking that they have a heart problem. She says the best way to make sure it's not the heart is a cardiac evaluation. That said, these alarming symptoms most likely are the result of a side effect of COVID-19, the lockdowns and things like virtual learning. It's just like us. Everybody's cooped up. They can't um, you know, socialize the way they normally would, which is super important for all of us. Um, and so I, I think also activity has decreased. If you're my age, that would be a sign of a heart attack. Right, absolutely. And that's, that's the difference. You know, for kids, almost 100% of the time, not always, but almost 100% of the time, it's not a cardiac related issue. It's been said time and again since this pandemic began that things like keeping to a routine schedule, eating right, exercising, and allowing your kids to interact with others in a safe, socially distant way will help keep them mentally healthy. And that should make a parent's heart feel good. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. So much gray out there Ugh. today and some temperatures that remind us this is still winter. <laughs> yes.
Not much movement in our temperatures today. We only went from 51 our morning low up to 57 at the airport because we were locked into the clouds today. But look elsewhere across South Texas, places off to the west of 35 like Del Rio, Maverick County, Eagle Pass. You saw a lot more sun today and that allowed your high temperatures to shoot into the 70s. Temperatures should be much more uniform as we get into the start of the weekend tomorrow. There's that cloud cover still fairly thick off east of I-35. It's trying to thin out a bit this evening and we may get a couple hours of clearing tonight, but overnight clouds will fill back in quickly and get the weekend off to a cloudy start. But don't worry, a lot of sunshine coming your way over the next couple of days. We'll talk about your weekend forecast coming up in just a bit. It's something we have heard about from doctors and nurses. Nearly a year into the pandemic, healthcare workers are feeling the exhaustion. Tonight on the Night Beat, how workers at one local hospital are dealing with stress and anxiety. And we've seen some good news in our local hospitals here lately as the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 has been steadily declining over the last couple of days. We've heard those numbers from the latest daily briefings over these last few days as well. We're just a few moments away from getting an update today. Really yesterday, the focus was so much on the vaccination effort that is happening, especially with people who are homebound and cannot make it out to a vaccination site. Let's go now live to City Hall. Rodriguez Yu, who is the Associate Director for Patient Services at Veteran Healthcare Administration in San Antonio. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 1,724 new cases of COVID-19. That uh, overall case no total now is a, above 180,000. It's at 180,386. The seven-day rolling average now is down to 1,361. 
We are also reporting 11 new deaths uh, this evening that have occurred within the last 14 days. That brings our total uh, deaths because of COVID in Bear County to 2,197. Uh, again, every single one of these numbers is a mother or a father, a son, a brother, a, a neighbor, someone who is missed. So please keep them, their loved ones, in your prayers. The number of patients being treated for COVID-19 in our hospitals has uh, reached a welcome benchmark. We're below 1,000 for the first time in many weeks. It's now at 999. That's down 82 from yesterday. There were 85 new to admissions in the last 24 hours down 43 from yesterday, 372 folks are in intensive care, and 217 are on ventilators. I want to remind you, if you have um, everyone in our community, now there are over a million people, I believe, that are eligible based on the state criteria, and we still are only receiving a very small number of vaccines to our community. The mass vaccination sites do not take walk-up um, administration. So you must have an appointment, whether it's at the Dome or Wonderland Mall, et cetera. And we're going to continue to make uh, appointments available as doses are sent to us. So please do not walk up uh, if you do not have an appointment at any of those sites. As you know, we had to postpone some second dose appointments this week due to delays in shipments of vaccines from the state. Some have expressed some concerns that pushing back their second dose will make the vaccine less effective. This is not true. The CDC states that the vaccine can be given up to six weeks after the first dose, and the time frame may lengthen as new data come in. Most vaccines, hepatitis and polio, for example, require more than one dose. And for various reasons, people are often unable to receive a second dose on time. And over decades, scientists have learned that giving a dose too soon can actually weaken a vaccine's effects. But it's almost never too late to give a subsequent dose. Those are called catch-up doses. Additionally, there has never been a need to start over. So the bottom line is, don't fret. Your second dose will be just as effective, if not more, if received a little later than scheduled. And that's a message directly from Metro Health. One last thing before I turn it over to the judge. I am amending my emergency order for San Antonio to align with the CDC guidance that require masks to be worn in all areas of the airport. If you're deplaning or entering the airport for any reason, you must be wearing a mask. Also, the airline operators must require all persons on board to wear masks when boarding, disembarking, or for the duration of travel. We will be enforcing that order here on the ground. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks for doing that emergency order on the city airport. I think that's really important. I'm glad the CDC is taking more recognition of that also. Because as time passes, we're going to see more and more people using it, flights again. So it's really, really, really important. Uh, yeah, we got down below 1,000, barely, but 999, we broke that 1,000 mark. So I think you'll see as we go through the next uh, few weeks a continuing decline, hopefully. If it follows what happened during the summer, uh, you'll see a time frame of 30 days or so maybe to get it down to them manageable number and to get down below 5% on our infection rate. So we're on the right track. We just all have to keep doing the same thing. And uh, as the mayor announced, that you do have to have a, a, um, a, a reservation to, to get the, to get the uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, we've been doing that. Uh, University Hospital go out there quite a bit. And at the, uh, we do it at the Robert B. Green downtown as well as the uh, Wonderland Mall. And uh, we do get a lot of compliments. Uh, a friend of mine the other day, Roger Gray, talked about how quick they got in, how well they handled it, how professional they were. So I get a lot of calls on that. I haven't had a negative call so far in how we handle people out there. It's all been positive. Uh, this past week, uh, between what we do down at the Robert B. Green and what we do at the Wonderland, uh, we did 23,544. Now, this week, we're going to get a little bit of a bounce of about 6,000 more vaccines. We don't know whether that's going to be, uh, uh, you know, an ongoing thing or not. It may be just for this week. Uh, so we now have scheduled uh, for uh, this next coming week, starting uh, Monday, uh, 24,600 uh, slots. Uh, 16,800 of them will be for the first shot, and 7,800 will be still getting their second shot. Now, part of the reason how we've been able to do more. You remember I showed you the difference in the two syringes, where if you have the right syringe, you can get uh, 
six doses out of all instead of five. So we've been doing that now for a while. So just with that alone, uh, we've increased our uh, ability to do vaccines by 20 percent. So uh, uh, that's a good step without even having to actually get a, a lot more doses from the state. Great. Thank you, Judge. And we have been making the message very clear to the White House and to the state that our vaccines are flowing uh, very well here and we have no problem administering them. So we need more to be sent to us. And that's a message for the White House and the state. All right. There you heard the mayor sending a message directly to the White House that he says he's been consistent in sending. We will get the vaccines into arms if you give us the vaccines. And right now, of course, demand is uh, outstripping supply. The numbers 1724, uh, that's a little high that we especially when you compare it to what we saw yesterday. But when you look at the hospitalizations, that's where perhaps the most encouraging numbers are today. Less than 1000 people are hospitalized right now uh, in the region for COVID-19, just 999 people. And, you know, the mayor called that an important milestone or benchmark. And as we see this surge, hopefully trend downward, we heard the county judge there talking about it. This is anything like what happened over the summer when the numbers were so high. It should take another 30 days or so to get to a number in our hospitals that he called manageable. Um, the mayor also reminded people that uh, there's a lot of concern over people getting their second dose appointments uh, for the vaccine postponed because of a delay in a shipment uh, to the city of San Antonio. We're getting a lot of questions about that, too. Will that affect uh, how effective the vaccine ultimately is? The mayor cited information he said from the CDC and Metro Health saying, don't worry about that. If your second dose is delayed more than the 21 or 28 days, uh, depending on Pfizer or Moderna, which one you got, that's OK. It's not going to make it any less effective. So something to keep in mind is they're trying to keep up uh, with the demand and the appointments that have already been scheduled. Yeah, and before we switch over to Katie and weather, I also want to mention he amended the emergency order. So masks will be required in all areas of the San Antonio airport going forward getting on, getting off planes during travel. All of that is uh, the amended emergency order that the mayor uh, implemented today. All right, now let's talk about weather and talk about what should be a great weekend. Don't judge the weekend by the Friday. <laughs> exactly, exactly. If today was not your cup of tea, it was a little cloudy and cool, and that's fine. But we like to get some sunshine in here on the weekend so that you can get out, get outside, get a little bit of fresh air. Fresh minus the cedar that may be lingering in the air, uh, but we've got some more <laughs> ups and downs here with our weather. So yesterday, very warm. A lot of us were in the 80s. We had a lot of sunshine today. Obviously, it's been a cloudy, cool day here in town. Our temperatures here in San Antonio limited to the 50s. Tomorrow, we'll go back the other direction. Won't be quite as warm as yesterday, but we'll start to see a nice warm up tomorrow with the return of some sunshine. So I mentioned any clearing that we see this evening will quickly be erased overnight and low clouds will build back in through early tomorrow morning. There could be a little bit of patchy fog out there early on your Saturday as well. Temperature wise, we'll start off low to mid 40s in many locations, but what will happen tomorrow morning mid morning and by about midday a weak frontal boundary will move in from the west. This boundary will sweep away all that cloud cover. Look by lunchtime tomorrow. A lot of us are seeing some sunshine. Certainly by mid afternoon tomorrow, uh, all of South Texas will be sitting under sunny skies, so we will see the morning clouds get swept out of here pretty quickly by tomorrow afternoon. That sunshine and the air being nice and dry will help to warm us up pretty much all of us into the 70s tomorrow afternoon. So widespread 70s across the board. Now behind that weak frontal boundary, it will get breezy tomorrow afternoon, late morning into the afternoon. We could see some wind gusts up closer to 25, 30 miles per hour, maybe briefly touching 35 miles per hour at times tomorrow afternoon. So a little bit breezy behind that boundary. Beautiful on Sunday, 37 in the morning. So Sunday will be cold, but otherwise very nice. Now middle back half of next week, that's where things get interesting. We expect some colder air to arrive, but when? That is the big question. We'll talk more about that coming up next half hour, guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. Larry has sports up next. In my mind, the best host site in the country for an NCAA championship. Mayor Ron Nirenberg is excited the women's big dance is coming to town in big board sports. San Antonio and the surrounding region will host the 2021 NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Championship due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 64 teams will compete from March 21st through April 4th, with a champion being crowned at the Alamo Dome. First round play will go down at the Dome at the Bill Grehe Arena on the campus of St. Mary's, the Frank Irwin Center in Austin, the University Events Center in Texas State, and the UTSA Convocation Center. The second round to the 
the finals will be played in San Antonio. Now, many expected this region in San Antonio to play host at a tournament, but it seemed to take a long time to announce it. San Antonio was was the city that we were exploring. Now, the reality is, is if, if through that exploration, if if it was if it had been the case that San Antonio just it was not possible to do this, then we certainly would have had to go and and find another location, one geographic area to do this. So through those contingency plans, there may have been a, may have been um, some ideas or a short list or whatever, but our energies and efforts in the committees was centered on San Antonio. Mayor Nuremberg says as of now, only the players' families can attend the games and a decision about allowing fans in will be made closer to the tournament based on health conditions at that time. And the Spurs are back to work and getting ready for the Houston Rockets. The season series is tied at one all after they split two games here in town last month. For point guard Derek White, the game tomorrow night will be just his fifth game this season and fourth in a row after coming back from a fractured toe. He said his toe is feeling good and now he's just trying to get back into a groove. Yeah, it's getting there. Um, I think last game I made a little more strides. I mean, the first game you feel great. You got a lot of um, adrenaline and everything. And then after that, you kind of come back to reality. So um, just got to keep getting my uh, legs underneath me uh, and just get my rhythm back. Well, Houston got its rhythm back last night by winning at Memphis 115 to 103. This after they lost to OKC the night before to snap their six game winning streak. John Wall led the Rockets with 22 points and Houston is now seven and four since trading James Harden. So Houston will host the Spurs tomorrow night at seven. Recently on Instant Replay, we told you about a local soccer player, Emily Rompel, and her quest to score 100 career goals. She's a junior and plays for St. John Paul II Catholic High School. And I'm happy to say she hit the century mark against New Braunfels Christian Academy on this strike right here. She started that night with 93 goals and she scored seven in a victory to reach 100. I was really excited for sure. Um, proud, I guess. Proud of myself. Proud of my team. Um, I felt a lot of support, too, from my team. They really helped me get there, for sure. I'm very proud of Emily. Like, being on the team with her these past few years, I've seen her grow, and I'm just really proud of also how the team has helped her get to that. So. Last night, JP2 beat Our Lady of the Hills 3 to nothing, and here's career goal 104 for Emily Rompel. And by the way, the team celebrated her 100th goal with a pizza party. Uh, Bend it like Rompel. <laughs> Bend it like Rompel. I love it. Yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You got it. Our case on Q&A is up next. So at least he sent me the video. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Mesa. Hi there. Hello. How are Thank you? Thank you so much for uh, inviting me on. Well, I think it's important that we have this conversation. I mean, it sounds like there are people who are worried about getting their cancer treatments in this age of COVID. Is that is that accurate? Correct. You know, both concerns about getting active treatment, which actually has gone very well, but also a lot of people either delaying screening or ignoring symptoms of cancer. Uh -huh. So we see people present with much more advanced cancers than we might otherwise. Wow. Well, I, I got your bullet points. And I, they're very interesting. We're about a minute 30 away from the actual interview, but can you also talk about the fears that people have about COVID and cancer? If it's whether they should get the vaccine or not, or if you know there are any effects of any more sure. severe effects? Uh, of course, yes, absolutely. It definitely asked me a vaccine question because definitely want to try to dispel people's concerns about that. We definitely want cancer patients vaccinated, and we have started vaccinating our cancer patients. Great. Oh, okay, wonderful. Anything else that wasn't in your bullet points that, that you would like us to touch on? No, those are those are the main things, you know, impact, screening, uh, how patients are kept safe, and the vaccine. Those would be all key things. Awesome. Okay. Great. And, and we're going to, it's about five minutes or so, so uh, okay. it's going to fly by. Perfect. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you. No, de de delighted to do it. Thank you.
It's been a dangerous side effect of life during a pandemic. People neglecting their own medical care over fears of COVID, especially when it comes to cancer. So for today's case at Q&A, we're bringing in Dr. Ruben Mesa with the Mays Cancer Center at UT Health, MD Anderson, to talk about these fears. Doctor, thanks for being with us. First, explain what you are seeing. What, what are some ways in which the pandemic is affecting how people seek care for cancer? Well, COVID has had a big impact as it relates to cancer. Uh, we have recognized that individuals with cancer have greater risk if they have COVID. Now, we've seen, one, that patients have been able to be treated safely for their cancers during this period, get safe surgery, chemotherapy, radiation be cured from their cancer. The challenge we've seen is that there has been a very sharp decrease in cancer screening, so colonoscopies, mammography, or individuals ignoring symptoms of cancer that they otherwise would have been uh, gone in to see their doctor. So we are seeing individuals present potentially with a later stage cancers, and we estimate that COVID might take even 10,000 additional lives from cancer due to delayed screenings in the years to come. Wow, a lot of yeah. concern about COVID in this time of cancer. And it, 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 talk about the safeguards that are in place specifically at the Mays Cancer Center. Like when, if, if I show up for cancer treatment, what safeguards are in place because of COVID? Well, we're incredibly proud of the tremendous effort of our team, our nurses, and all of our staff to keep both patients, their family members, and our staff safe. So that includes uh, rigorous screening at the door with temperature, mandatory masking, social distancing, you know, very extensive cleaning protocols. We never paused on caring for cancer patients for even a moment during the pandemic and have cared for more cancer patients than we had in 2019. We cared for even more in 2020 uh, in a safe way. So we're very, uh, Please that we were able to accomplish that while keeping patients, family members, and our staff safe. There are so many questions out there about the COVID-19 vaccine. We hear from viewers every day with various different scenarios they're curious about, and a lot of them have to do with cancer. If they are current cancer patients, if they have had cancer in the past, the big question is, is it safe for those people to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I would say overall, yes. I've had this direct conversation with the director of the National Cancer Institute and even with Dr. Anthony Fauci. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines we feel are safe for cancer patients and cancer survivors. Uh, there is a question in individuals that are cancer survivors or are on treatment, uh, how effective the vaccine will be, but we feel that even if it's partially effective, it can provide life-saving protection against the virus. So we're very proud that we have been able to begin vaccinating our cancer patients, and that's very much in accordance with the national guidelines. We're pleased to be able to give them that protection against the terrible COVID virus. Do you find that people are just afraid to come into a hospital setting for any reason now because of COVID? Unfortunately, yes, we've seen that again, both with cancer, but with other diseases, such as not coming in for a heart attack or a stroke. I can assure people watching that our healthcare environments are safe to come into. They're tremendously strict protocols. And I would say the city of San Antonio has done an extraordinary job. So both our University of UT Health San Antonio and the Mays Cancer Center, but clearly our colleagues here in town at other systems, it is safe to come in for your care if you have a symptom, a concern, uh, a lump, chest pain, shortness of breath, this is not the time to ignore your health care. Uh, you can receive the health care that you require in a safe way. What would your message be to people? I mean, I, something that stuck out to me that you said earlier is you're seeing people with further advanced cancers because they're just delaying that treatment sometimes over COVID-19. So what is your message to anybody who feels like they either need to get a screening, they've been putting off something routine? What would you tell them they need to do right now? Unfortunately, cancer is not on a lockdown. So if you have cancer, uh, 
it is going to progress if we don't find it early. Cancer screenings can help to save lives, which is why they've made such an impact. So get your colonoscopy, get your mammogram, and if you have any signs or symptoms that you are not well, a, a lump, uh, blood in the stool, losing weight unexpectedly, any of these typical early signs of cancer, do not ignore them. See your primary care doctor or anything urgent. Do not fear going in to see your doctor emergently. Because in a lot of cases, early detection saves lives. That's really what we're talking about. Dr. Ruben Mesa with the Mays Cancer Center at UT Health San Antonio MD Anderson. Appreciate your time and expertise on this subject. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. It is something that is required to happen, but it is also something that can be very contentious. We are talking about redistricting and not just contentious in the state of Texas, but really around the country. Contentious and confusing all at yes. the same time. Redistricting happens every 10 years. It's what lawmakers, it's when they become map makers, essentially. They are deciding how to break up the state of Texas in order that to ultimately decide who represents you in Washington. So it's something that uses census data, America's headcount every 10 years. It's supposed to happen during this legislative session. So the focus of this week's episode of KSAT Explains is explaining what is redistricting? How does it happen? Who decides how this map looks at the end of the day uh, and why it always is so contentious and can be such a heated battle. We go into all of those things and talk about what's going to be different this year because it is a unique year. Well, I, I have a question for you about the census. Yes. The census is delayed. What yep. does that mean for redistricting? Will redistricting be delayed? Yes, is the answer in short. So it's expected that, you know, lawmakers may not actually get a map drawn, according to some of the experts we talked to, until August or September. Then come typically the lawsuits challenging those. Mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, you know, a group believes that one voter group has been disenfranchised or suppressed by those, the way those maps are drawn. But then you got to remember just around the corner, we have the March primaries and the candidate filings for those towards the end of the year. So this timeline could be really messy when it comes to redistricting this go around. A big part of that is those delayed census results. Redistricting always seems messy no matter what state we're talking about. And <laughs> yes. you might remember the last time we did redistricting, a bunch of San Antonio lawmakers left the state so there wasn't a quorum so people could vote. There was some drama. There was drama. Mm -hmm. Check out this latest episode of KSAT Explains, ksat.com slash explains or the KSAT TV app. Let's go to Katie Blake now with weather. Thanks, guys. We'll take another look outside with live cam. Still holding on to a good amount of cloud cover here in San Antonio. Areas west of 35 did manage to clear out and squeeze in some sun before the day was up, but not a whole lot of bright sunshine for us here in the Alamo City. That will change as we get into the weekend. So 53 now, light easterly winds, just about 5 to 10 miles per hour, and of course still reading cloudy at the airport. I do think over the next couple of hours we could see a little bit of clearing, maybe partly to mostly clear late tonight, but overnight through early tomorrow morning, clouds build back in, and your Saturday will actually get off to a pretty gray start. Don't worry, we will get some sunshine going even by lunchtime tomorrow. So a sunny weekend, we're warming up and then cooling down. But when and how much, we'll talk about that coming up in just a few minutes. Have to say, all in all, the first five days of February have been nice. <laughs> really nice. Yeah, really yeah. nice. Yes, I mean. <laughs> Today may be the exception, but. Yeah. For the majority so far, it's been nice. It's been great. But it's still early. I, for one, love the warmth. It was a little bit warmer than it should be this time of year yesterday, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I thought it was I thought it was kind of great. But if that was not your cup of tea, maybe you like today a little bit better. But we've got more changes coming this weekend. Uh, before we focus on the weekend, I do want to talk about kind of what is in the elephant in the room, at least amongst the weather team, and that's the potential for some big time Arctic air to move in sometime next week. So all of our forecast models are in pretty good agreement that we're going to stay warm through early next week through Monday, Tuesday. But look at all this blue purple when the temperature 
scale starts to go to white. That's when you know it's really, really cold. So there is going to be a lot of very cold air up in the central plains, the Midwest, and then certainly in the northern plains and up closer to the Great Lakes next week. The question remains, when exactly does this colder air get to us? And in terms of that question, we have very poor agreement across our forecast models. So that means our forecast confidence for this cold air arrival is low at this time. Now, over the next few days, forecast confidence should gradually grow, but there's still a lot of question as to exactly when this very cold air gets to us here in South Texas. Just how cold will it be? That's another big question as well. For now, I do have our cool down settling in middle to back half of next week. Again, we'll likely be tweaking these numbers from Wednesday and beyond, and there is a potential for next weekend to be fairly cold as well. Again, a lot of questions we still need to iron out over the next couple of days. So if you're a cold weather fan and you're cheering this on, keep checking back with us over the next few days. In the meantime, all the way through early next week, it will be staying on the warmer side. Today's time lapse paints a pretty gray picture out there. We were stuck under the clouds here in the Alamo City and still are tonight. I'm seeing a little bit of clearing out there, but certainly too late to get any warm up uh, in place today. Uh, as we head into the overnight hours, low clouds will start to build back in. So very early tomorrow, it will be pretty gray. You'll wake up and be like, I thought there was supposed to be sun this weekend. Well, as we get into tomorrow afternoon, weak little front will come through, help to clear out all that cloud cover, and it'll be sunny Saturday afternoon, and the sunshine will carry over uh, into Sunday. And future cast paints this out pretty well. Low clouds building back in tonight, maybe some patchy fog through early tomorrow as well. And then beautifully, this boundary is going to move through by lunchtime tomorrow, clear out the cloud cover that will allow everyone to see some sunshine, and we'll see widespread high temperatures in the 70s tomorrow as compared to just really off to the west. They were in the 70s today, so nice day coming up tomorrow. It will get breezy tomorrow afternoon after that boundary moves through north northwest winds 10 to 20. We could see some gusts up to 25 30 miles per hour at times tomorrow afternoon. And of course, because we're still dealing with some lingering cedar, maybe those breezy winds tomorrow could up the cedar count into Sunday. So something to keep in mind again, some gusts up closer to 30 miles per hour late tomorrow morning into tomorrow afternoon. Definitely not out of the question. Beautiful on Sunday, cold in the morning, 37, but up to 70 in the afternoon. And then things get very interesting. Middle back half of next week. Again, we've still got a lot of questions to answer, but it does look like we'll see a cool down for the back half of next week. Guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's I see why am I. Friday, we made it. It is February 5th. San Antonio Fire Department says an apartment building will need to be torn down after an overnight fire. Firefighters say they do not know what caused this fire yet, but it was so big it caused the floors to collapse inside. After nearly five months, the family of Daryl Zamalt watched the body cam footage of his fatal shooting. Zamalt shot by an SAPD officer back in September of last year. Zamalt's daughter spoke with the crowd after watching that video, thanking them for their support. She did not comment on what she saw on the video, but joined the crowd in a moment of silence in honor of her father. Medical examiner's office identifying the victim as 52 year old Eugene Perry Howard. Police found him dead with three gunshot wounds to the torso in the front yard of a home. Investigators believe one or more people walked up to Howard while he was in his car and shot him. The firefighters finding themselves in a race against nature at the scene of a house fire. It was about 3.30 this morning, not just to fight the fire when they arrived, but also the wind. 20 miles per hour wind made containing the flames a tough job. Investigators say the home where the fire started had already been destroyed. Today, Senate Democrats forging ahead on COVID relief. Vice President Kamala Harris breaking a 50-50 tie after a grueling 15-hour session where senators got to vote on amendments to the White House's $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan that could shape what ends up in the final bill. The budget reconciliation bill that passed means Democrats can pass coronavirus relief without any GOP support. <laughs> Today is a national day that even Adam Kasky might approve of. 
but he's not. Maybe. <laughs> it is a day to honor those who work hard to accurately forecast and report the always changing, often unpredictable weather. Today is National Weather Persons Day. It honors all individuals in the fields of meteorology, weather forecasting, and broadcast meteorology. But good news, meteorologist Katie Blake is here to accept the accolades on behalf of the KSAT weather team. <laughs> National Weather Persons Day also pays tribute to volunteers, storm spotters, observers, and others who work in the meteorology field. February 5th is the birthday of John Jeffries. Born in 1744, he is a scientist and surgeon considered to be one of America's first weather observers. National Weather Persons Day has been around for more than four decades. Happy National Weather Persons Day, Katie. Thank, thank you. I appreciate it. I will, I will accept... Um... I hope you, on behalf of my wonderful teammates. I hope you got the flowers I sent. I, I didn't. <laughs> I'll have to double Something check. Must, oh, the happened. mail. Uh, Bluebell bought, brought us some ice cream. That's pretty cool. Ooh. Some Bluebell. That's always nice. That's better than flowers. <laughs> Uh, the weekend is going to be nice. We'll start off cloudy in the morning, but we'll see sun by tomorrow afternoon. That will continue into Sunday. Warming through early middle part of next week. That colder air, when will it get here? Still kind of a question. So we'll be tweaking that forecast over the course of the weekend. In the meantime, enjoy the sunshine, guys. Our weather, I mean, our weather people really should have been featured in that video. Should have. That's yeah. all, all I'm saying. They work hard for their degree.